Hi, I'm Matt Bach. I'm not, I'm not actually Matt Bach. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, Matt Bach uh, cannot be here. He is dealing with a family situation. Uh, but uh, he was supposed to introduce the speaker, uh, and I really want him to get the recognition he deserves uh, because he really did a tremendous amount of work putting together uh, practice this year. So uh, Matt, if you're watching the stream at some point in the future, uh, let's all give Matt a nice round of applause for the hard work he did. Uh, we're about to have another great talk, uh, followed immediately by uh, open problems. Uh, so those of you who have your open problems, be ready to go right after this talk ends, uh, followed by a happy hour. Uh, so we've got a lot of great content still go coming today. Uh, I'm going to start by reading uh, this introduction that uh, Matt Bach wrote up. I know it's a little weird that I'm a Matt and he's a Matt. It's sort of a Dick Sargent, Dick York situation here, but uh, it's a, it seemed like the best possible replacement uh, given the situation. Uh, so uh, Matt has sent along his introduction. So he said, I'm sorry I can't be uh, with you all today. Uh, I'm incredibly sorry I won't be able to see this next talk. Uh, Zach McClendon is a veteran game designer and a fountain of practical, applicable design wisdom. He has a keen sense of process and works to ensure that teams are truly in alignment. Uh, his rigorous communi communicative approach to the game design process elevates those he works with and deeply inf is deeply informed by his own approach to collaborative processes. Uh, while practice tends to delve into specific design details over repeatable process, in a conference oriented around tools, I think it's vital uh, to consider the ways that our processes can enable, inhibit, and otherwise shape design outcomes. Zach's skills in this er arena are world-class and field-tested. I'm excited he's there <laughs> with you all today. So uh, please join me in welcome welcoming Zach McClendon. That was a very nice introduction from Matt. I didn't know all of that about myself. Uh, <laughs> Hi, okay, so my talk today uh, is called Welcome to the Yard Sale, a Practical Framework uh, for Holistic Design. Um, just a little bit more about myself. Um, I'm joining you today from uh, San Francisco where I work at Double Fine. I'm the project lead on Psychonauts 2. Um, I've been working as a game designer and design lead in the industry since the early 2000s. Uh, I built and led design teams at places like Crystal Dynamics, Harmonix, 2K Marin, um, and now Double Fine, uh, where I like it very well. Um, these are some of the games that I've worked on in the past. Uh, if that is of interest to you, some good, some not so good. I'll be talking about all of them. Um, and today, uh, in sort of keeping with the, the premise of practice, uh, talking about practice, uh, process, and tools, um, I'm going to be talking about a design framework that I've been using and evolving for uh, most of my career. I don't have a great name for this framework. I just call it the big board, um, and that's the name that I'm going to use for it today. So if you've got a more exciting sounding name, please let me know. Uh, a number of people I've worked with in the past um, using this process has gone on to adapt it, um, use it for their own games or projects they've been involved with. Um, these are some of the things they've worked on, it, uh, worked on games with in the past. Um, and they've encouraged me to share it with people, which is why uh, I am here today, sort of going through this. This is the first time I've kind of presented this material to people, so um, it might be just a little bit dense. Uh, but here goes. Um, okay, so what is the big board? It's basically a process to develop two big things. Um, one is a physical board that describes the core directions, goals, values, and feature sets of your project, uh, kind of all in one physical place that you can carry around. Um, and the other, more important thing, is a team that's built this thing together and has a shared understanding of all of these things mapped out in their heads and how they connect. Um, basically, it's a repeatable, collaborative process that you can use for small projects or large projects. I've mostly used it uh, in large projects, but you can use it for small personal projects as well. To go from nothing to something or to jump into something that's already in progress and kind of a little bit of a mess and try to give it some shape and direction. Um, that's the Psychonauts board in progress. I scrambled everything, so hopefully nobody can read any spoilers on that. Um, <laughs> if done really well, uh, you can get a bunch of different benefits for it. You can try to get unity across your team in terms of your creative goals from an early point, articulate high-level uh, uh, direction in a way that's generative and actionable for people, um, expose creative conflicts and hidden assumptions, not just sort of within your game design, but within your team as well, um, and forge a shared creative vocabulary and language for your team to use, sort of localized within that team community that you're building. Um, and most importantly, at least for me, is to keep everyone creatively 
honest as they go about building a project. Um, not only to the goals of the game that you're building, but creatively honest to your, your own desires and values personally. Um, because fundamentally, I believe that, that games are a form of communication. Uh, hopefully, that's not too controversial. Um, what people get out of the games that we make is related to what we put in. It's not one to one, but there's obviously a relationship there. Uh, and it's important to make games that contain ideas that you want to contribute to the world um, and to our culture. They create, communicate, or give something that you think is valuable to, to others. And in order to do that, you need to create in an intentional way that expresses your values as a human being as, and as uh, an artist. Um, and it's important that you have a that it's important that you have a voice and you think about what that voice is saying in the games that you make. Um, what are your values and how is the game expressing them? This process is my attempt to do this individually as well as across larger teams um, and to get a, a, you know, often a very large team to speak with a coherent voice and to, to think about what it's saying and intend what it's saying. Um, so today I'm going to walk through kind of how I started out using this process and some gruesome history of some failures that led to it, a uh, high-level overview of creating one yourself kind of structurally, um, detailed discussion of the way that I do it now and the creative categories I've, I've uh, sort of arrived at, um, and then how, once you've created one, how you can use one for creative iteration uh, or sort of the drive process and decisions on your project. Um, and then I'll finish up with some caveats and some advice. Um, so to talk about the big board, uh, I first need to talk about the problem that I was trying to solve. And to talk about that, I need to talk about the problem that I got myself into at the time. Um, so uh, back in about 2006, I was working at Crystal Dynamics. Um, I just shipped a kind of uh, weird uh, first-person shooter called Project Snowblind. Not sure if anybody, well, one, one person there. If you search on Project Snowblind, <laughs> if you search for Project Snowblind online, you'll find this wonderful image of a Cyberman punching a soldier in his crotch, uh, which is the best image online of Project Snowblind. Um, it was my first game as a designer. Uh, I felt pretty good about my overall contribution to it, um, and I guess other people did too, because they had me immediately start pitching giant multi-million dollar projects. Um, eventually, I got a project approved with me and uh, Lee Petty uh, co-leading it. He's the other project lead at Double Fine. We're reunited now, which is very nice. Um, uh, but the thing to know about this game is basically it was about big natural disasters, and it was itself a big giant disaster. Um, I don't need to go into the details, like many canceled games. It was never announced. We worked on it for a long time. Um, it was called Downfall. Uh, pro tip for all of you, don't name your first big risky creative work. <laughs> After abject failure, uh, the jokes aren't funny before or after. Um, uh, and you know you can find info about it online. This is a screen cap from uh, Unseen64, which is a great website that has a bunch of sad, broken dreams of people who have never finished their projects. Um, I didn't leak the stuff. I would have leaked cooler looking images than those ones. Um, but the big thing to know about it for, for this discussion is that it was really massively out of scope. Um, it was bloated. It was conflicted. It was basically kind of like all four of these games, plus a few more trying to happen all at the same time. Um, and this was before even the, the 360 launch back in the day. Um, it was kind of a problem, because basically, I had no idea what I was doing uh, as a creative lead. Um, this is a screenshot from a game I would go on to make called I Have No, what I, no Idea What I'm Doing, uh, which tried to capture that process in VR. Um, I didn't know anything uh, about being a creative lead. I had a good background in game design, um, but I'd never designed a big, giant AAA game, and I'd never uh, managed a whole team creatively like that. Um, I did know a couple of, of good tricks uh, to try to get people invested and excited in a project, um, which is just to let people contribute ideas and invest something of themselves in the project, um, and to propose that you're doing really ambitious things that are really hard that no one has ever seen or done before. Um, these can be useful techniques for, uh, for building buy-in and excitement and also getting your pitch approved from your corporate masters. Um, but if you just do them, you can get yourself into some pretty big trouble. Uh, I mostly just did those two things. Um, I sort of saw myself at the time as kind of a creative hoarder, as a person whose job it was to find a home for everybody's ideas, including mine, and to bring them all into the design and make everyone happy by seeing the thing that they really loved represented somewhere within the game. Um, and this, of course, led to you know, a situation kind of like that. Huge scope, enough ideas for like five different games, no clear unity of purpose across the team, uh, and several completely impossible ideas kind of shoved in there also to boot. Um, we built a ton of things over about two years, which is not an insubstantial amount of time, um, and we got to a, a vertical slice, uh, and then basically this happened. Um, this is what's called in skiing or snowboarding a yard sale. Uh, it's basically when you just eat it so hard that everything that's kind of on your person goes like flying out uh, out into the snow and it's just lying there all kind of displayed for everybody to see. Um, 
And, and you certainly aren't really going to do any skiing for a little while. And we weren't going to be uh, doing any game making for a bit um, because we didn't know what all this stuff kind of added up to. Um, and my instinct was to, to look at all this stuff now that we sort of had wiped out and sort of spilled it all out on the front yard um, and, and evaluate it uh, and to try to turn um, this bad version of the yard sale into the good version of a yard sale. Um, I love yard sales. I love having them. Um, I love going to them. I'm really nosy. I sort of like love looking at all the little piles of stuff and kind of reverse engineering people's lives and like the version of their life that they're letting go of and the version of the life that they might never have gotten to and it's kind of what choices led them to that. Um, and out of context, uh, out, of the out in the driveway or out in the front lawn, um, you can look at each thing and evaluate it on its own and its relationship to your own values and the life that you're trying to, to build for yourself. Um, and that single jumbled flat context has this kind of raw honesty that's super valuable. Like you can look at a thing and be like, what is this milkshake mixer worth? Do I have space for it in my house? Um, I bought a milkshake mixer and then sold it at the yard sale, both a yard sale, so that happens sometimes. Um, so this is sort of the philosophy of the yard sale that like all things are good. All the ideas everyone has is good. All the directions, all the designs, all the values, um, all of those things are inherently they have worth in the right context um, and people have a lot of feelings and attachments to them uh, but they need to be grouped together into the right context for the life that you're trying to build um, and what you really value uh, and you have to curate all of that intentionally around your values and your goals you have to agree with yourself or your family or your team or your collaborators what you're actually really trying to make together and, and what you value um, and get the right stuff for it and it needs to fit together it needs to justify its existence and you need a plan um, you can't just collect all the cool weird junk that you see and bring it home because then you'll be a creepy hoarder, uh, and then you won't have a cool yard sale, you'll have a really creepy estate sale. And I'll go to those sometimes, and those are not, those are not, those are not as exciting to me. Um, uh, so we did that for this project, for Downfall. Um, we built the first version of what I've come to call the big board. At the time, it was just a yard sale. Uh, we did it collaboratively in a shared space using physical handwritten cards. We went through everything that was in the game, and we put it in the yard sale, all of the ideas, all the creative direction, all the features we built, um, and we wrote them down uh, in little cards. We divided them up into low-level, kind of high-level goals for the project, things that we valued, and actual features we had built, um, and we made a hierarchy out of it. Um, and then we got really concrete about what each one of those things actually meant. And if we couldn't really define what it was supposed to mean, if it was something vague and wishy-washy or something we couldn't really realize or didn't agree on, um, we kept on breaking it down until we knew what we were talking about and could fit it on a single card. Then we took all these cards and we prioritized them and stack ranked them um, in terms of how important we thought they were for the whole project. And it was a really long and grueling process, but we really didn't have much else to do because the game was on its way to being canceled. Um, when we got through this process, we learned a lot. It became really, really clear once you had it all sort of splayed out visually like that, uh, that there was enough uh, stuff going on for five or six complete games, um, some of which we liked and some of which we, we didn't like. Um, there were a lot of conflicted values and ideas both within the team, um, which was a pretty large team by this point, um, and within the game. And it would have been impossible uh, to fully embrace both sides of some of these conflicts. They were just mutually exclusive. There's no way you can make a game with both those things in them. Um, and these issues with scope and focus and creative conflict basically led to the demise of that project. Um, but the process that we had developed over time seemed really, really healthy and really good and collaborative. Um, and so I wanted to take that and further refine it, um, ideally on a project that was in pre-production, uh, where you could go through with the team and sort of build this understanding from, from the ground up um, and this idea of core values with the whole team. And so that's what I did at 2K Marin. Um, I took the beginning of this process over there for uh, Bioshock 2. Um, and I'm going to be going through it now with a lot of examples from uh, a lot of stuff from Bioshock 2 because I literally have the cards at home in my basement in a, in a box. Um, and then some stuff from Psychonauts 2 that's not too spoilery and then some made up stuff. Um, so how to have your very own yard sale. Step one. Um, this is easy. You just get your supplies. Uh, you can go down to Home Depot and get yourself a cork board, cork board and lots of little note cards. You will need lots of little note cards, especially if you're like me and you have terrible handwriting that no one can read. Um, Step two, get your people. Uh, this works best if you can um, have your collaborators with you on the project from a very early point and get you know, four to eight stakeholders um, who are going to stick with you this whole process. Uh, you can do it with um, fewer people with that. If you're an indie, that might be your whole team. You can do it by yourself, um, although it is incredibly valuable to have somebody else to keep you honest and to bounce ideas off of. Um, if it gets larger than eight or 10 people, uh, it's less of a conversation, and so that's probably, probably too many to do with it. Um, step three, start with whatever your prompt or your inspiration or your creative challenge is. Um, it might be an assignment, it might be a prototype you've already built, it might be the overlap of creative interests between all of your collaborators or a general creative space that you want to build, um, you want to explore together. Um, or you know, maybe you already have a design that's in progress that's kind of not quite coming along and you want to get it more structured out. Um, 
From there, uh, you just have to work out your creative hierarchy and figure out um, what are the categories you want to use for your high, medium, and low-level ideas. I'll talk about the specific ones I use that have gone through a lot of iteration, but I kind of want to do an overview of the, the process for people first um, before I dive down into each one of those. Um, but the basic idea is you need to have a category that represents your, your creative goals, what's most important to you about the game. What is it really about? What are the things that you hope someone would get out of it, or why would somebody play it? Um, your values, what is important to how you make it? What values will guide decision-making? What you hope that games do, game will express about what you value in design or in culture, um, and then all the specific features and content that you want to pursue to actually build that thing. Um, then you move on to generating ideas. Um, this is pretty standard brainstorming at this point. Um, you'll just want to capture every idea, feature, desire, goal, anything that anyone in your collaborative group kind of wants for this game. Um, not just low-level stuff, but mid and high-level stuff and lofty goals, uh, and to cast a very, very wide net at this point, um, including ideas outside your comfort zone of what you think the project might be, because at this point, you're just capturing kind of raw material, and it's totally okay to have two ideas that are completely mutually exclusive. You can just stick them both down on cards and move on. Um, I usually do this for a couple of weeks. It tends to be grueling and, and uh, brain storm kind of runs out of ideas at a, suit, at a certain point. Um, then you need to set up all the cards in your creative hierarchy, get everything down on a card. Um, there's no bad ideas in brainstorming, but there may be some ideas that are just clearly not fit for the project that you're making. But in general, try to almost everything that seems at all viable, actually get it up on the board um, and sort them into the creative categories. Don't stress too much about getting it into the right category. Um, your categories may change over time, and also you, know, you may find something that originally just starts life as a feature is actually the most important creative goal of, of the game over time, and things move around all the time. You're just trying to get the board shaped up and onto a physical board that you can look at together and, and discuss. Um, at this point, Congratulations, you have some sort of amorphous game blob uh, that's sitting on a wall. Um, this is a bunch of uh, boards from different projects that, that me or people I know have worked on. Um, but uh, now you get on to the, the hard and interesting stuff. Now you actually have it up on a board. Um, first, you have to figure out what every card actually means, and you have to agree on it with the full team. Discussion of terms. Um, you literally have to discuss every single card and come to an agreement as to what it means in a concrete and actionable way and what you actually would, would build because of that thing. Um, and you try to come up with a working definition that the team agrees to. Um, this could be defining uh, what you really mean or really imply by some lofty creative goal. Uh, it could be articulating what a value implies or doesn't for you and your collaborators, um, or detailing out a, a specific feature. I've populated this list randomly, but if anybody wants to make the game just described there, um, I think it'd be really cool. Uh, <laughs> this is really hard work, um, defining things. Uh, but these are local working team definitions at, at a high level. So don't worry about like defining things for real or for the industry or for anyone even outside your team. You're worried about building a language with your collaborators that you can continue to use as you build out the rest of the project. Um, uh, and if you can't make a concrete definition, you might need to break it down further into multiple concepts so you can discuss those ideas independently. Often there's a pattern of taking complex, vague, squishy concepts, breaking them down into really, really concrete stuff, and then combining them back up into a shorthand that you use for the rest of the project. Um, so on Bioshock 2, uh, we had a core design value of immersion, which is a super kind of garbage concept that's super slippery and means a million things to different people. Um, and over talking about it and breaking down of what it actually meant for us for that project, uh, we broke it down into three pretty simple, straightforward things, which is the idea of having a a continuous first-person experience that we'd never break away from, um, having a consistent simulation that sort of followed all the same consistent rules and we wouldn't cheat uh, often, if at all, um, and this concept of say yes to the player, we'd be doing expectation-based design. Say yes to the player was a, a concept they developed on Bioshock 1, which was if you expect it to happen in the game, you should probably try to support that thing. Um, those things recombined into our concept of, of immersion, which was super localized to the project and special to us, but at that point, you know, if we talked about it, we all knew what we were talking about. Um, and on the board, you actually take the cards that you've articulated subcards for, and you can just pin them under the main card of immersion. And then if you ever want to do the archaeology of like, what the hell were we talking about? You can flip back through it and see all the different things that you've talked about and combine into that one concept. Um, so you have to rework and restate the cards until you all get an understanding of what they mean for your goals, for your values, for your features, and agree on them. Um, this might also involve uh, reworking your, your creative categories. You may find that they don't really work for the kind of thing that you're, that you're making. Um, if you get bogged down, you can always just move on because if anything is vague, um, it will come up again in the next step or in subsequent steps. Uh, okay, then on to stack ranking. Um, using whatever method you want, uh, you need to go have, and have the whole team stack rank all the cards linear, literally in linear order together, and you have to agree on it together. Um, this is a really long discussion often. Uh, and first you want to um, 
uh, you want to go through and get every card to have a place in linear order across all of your categories. But the idea here that higher rank goals will get more support and are more central to the heart of the project and lower rank goals may be things that you are not going to end up doing at all. Um, higher rank values are used more often to make decisions on how to do things and how to represent things within the game. And when goals and values are in conflict, the higher rank ones are the ones that you will rely on using to make decisions going forward. Um, it's not as important to get all of your features into a specific bucket at this point. I'll go into a feature prioritization because it's usually, depending on the size of your project, there will be hundreds of features and stack ranking them is really tedious. Um, uh, but several things happen at this step once you actually force people to try to stank or stank, stank back. Stack rank all of these ideas. Um, it puts ideas into conflict naturally uh, and, it expo and because of that it exposes conflicting goals or things that are hard to do on the same time and it forces you to choose priority between them which prompts a million interesting conversations across your team. Um, you may have a creative goal to tell a highly linear three act story but a design goal to have a game that has high replayability. Um, you can do both those things at the same time. They aren't really helping each other much. Um, and it's really useful to have a working definition of which one of those things is more important to you. Um, ranking conflicts like this uh, helps articulate what you actually value and think is important for the project. Um, they also expose weak definitions, especially of your values. Um, if you don't know what you mean on the team by accessibility or depth when you try to rank one against the other, that question will absolutely come up and you'll dive down into that conversation to define what those things mean locally for your project. Um, Ranking can also make it clear when you have big ideas that you really are not committed to. Um, often there's big ambitious ideas that need to be in sort of the top five of the stack rank if they have any uh, chance of ever getting done. Um, but for whatever reason, often because you have five other ideas that are super exciting, you can't get them up there. Um, these are things that your team is probably going to fail at. Uh, you need to either cut it, move it up, or be okay with having kind of a modest delivery of, of that idea. Um, often this happens with narrative goals that aren't embedded enough in the core design uh, or massive gameplay systems that you just don't have the scope to actually develop. Um, in the case of Bioshock 2, our original idea idea as one of our creative goals, we were going to have this massive swath of underwater gameplay. Um, we were going to rebuild kind of all the systems out underwater and you'd be able to fight under there and do hacking and all the other things you could do in Bioshock, but also underwater. Um, and it sort of came directly into conflict with our core value of immersion that if we were going to do any amount of underwater gameplay, we had to build an entire kind of systemic ecology out there. Um, and it just was completely out of scope for what we could build. And also underwater combat was like, or underwater gameplay was, under, was like the fifth or sixth thing down. Um, so features kept on getting deprioritized and deprioritized uh, until we um, finally shifted an extremely bare bones version of underwater gameplay, which was you could go underwater. Um, <laughs> and, and that was it. Um, so keep an eye, uh, an eye out for sort of low ranked big ideas because that should be a red flag for you. Um, in all of these cases, try to come to a resolution the team really believes in or at least is willing to agree to right then um, and really embrace what it would mean to have a card in the top few spots. Um, are you really committed to doing that? Are you really have like sort of a feature plan that's gonna get you there? Um, and what does it mean to have a goal that you're all excited about that's like, 10th thing on your list and what are you going to do with it? Um, usually this drives deeper and contentious discussions of definitions of goals and values and exposes conflicts again. Um, and you usually need to do a, full, a couple of sweeps of prioritization like this to get the thing kind of in shape. Um, it's possible to get really stalled out at this state and get in a big fight about like ranking two specific things next to each other. Um, and usually that's indicative of something kind of at the heart of the project that really needs to be resolved. And it's not just about those two cards on a board. Um, and I'll get into some of those conflicts later. Um, step nine, scoping. As you move through all of this, um, cards will naturally sort of move down in priority. And as they move further and further and further down, people kind of understand where they're headed. Uh, and um, as they get to the bottom, people become willing to cut them. Because when you deal with the game holistically like this, people begin to understand the scope of things and how they connect. Um, and those priorities and cuts start to seem pretty reasonable. Uh, and there's a huge benefit for team buy-in for people to go through that experience and sort of go through the process of placing ideas on the board, arguing over them, defining them, seeing them move down and agree to finally sort of let them drop off the end of that table. Um, and it really builds a, a huge amount of team buy-in about the plan you're doing and the things that you're not doing. Um, so you repeat that as needed. Uh, you know, you go back to brainstorming ideas if you don't have enough ideas and defining them if they're too vague and ranking them if you are arguing against uh, the stack ranking of them. Um, and over a few iterations, you should arrive at something that feels coherent. Uh, like it has a sense of unity and purpose and intentionality and, and most importantly um, expresses the things that your team really values. Uh, at this point, a, a good big board should have high-level goals that are clearly expressed in kind of the values and the features and the content and lower-level content and features that contribute directly to your higher-level goals. You should be able to sort of track this across the board. Um, and what you end up with is a co coherent design and a direction for the game, hopefully, uh, and a team that understands why each piece is there and what it's contributing um, and how they're all connected. Um, at least ideally. So that's the basic process. Um, I found it varies a lot depending uh, on the people, but also depending on the categories you use for your high and your low level concepts um, and how they're framed. 
Um, and I've used a lot of different frameworks for those um, and iterated on them a lot and I've arrived at some place that I think is pretty valuable for a lot of different reasons. So I'd like to walk through the categories that I use um, at, within this process. Uh, but I would encourage everybody to sort of come up with whatever categories are the most useful to you. These are just kind of some things I've learned having used this process in the past. Um, for high level goals, I use something called creative promises. Um, for uh, values, I break those down into design values and cultural values. Um, features get broken down into a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, there's interaction paradigms, which are kind of like super features, uh, and then a whole bunch of feature uh, sub uh, subcategories that I'll, I'll get into when I get to feature prioritization, um, and some novelty categories as well that end up being very important. Um, so uh, you know, there's this big problem of like, how do you talk about what is most important about your project, and how do you talk about it with the team, um, and how do you talk about it when the game is sort of still very early and that stuff is not on screen? Um, and there's a lot of different frameworks for for that, uh, and I've used a lot of different ones. I've been forced to use a lot of different ones. Um, and they've all been lacking to me in different ways. Um, there's the idea of a vision, uh, which really has the idea of something kind of mystical being locked away in one person's head and the team is there to help translate it out. Um, and that's never been my experience of making games. Games are very collaborative. They have like multiple parents that are sort of helping bring them into the world and working with your collaborator changes what that thing is that you make. And that's what I really value about making games um, personally. And so the idea of a vision has always been this sort of like rigid auteur kind of thing, keeper of the flame um, that I don't like very much. Uh, USPs are unique selling points, which hopefully very few people here have to deal with. This is a market definition of defining your game in differentiation to everything else in the market. Um, it's not a, just not a good framework for aesthetic work. If you're trying to make something that feels personally meaningful, uh, it's a market definition. Um, and it doesn't focus on what you actively want to create or express. Um, pillars are popular and they're good. My issue with pillars tends to be that they're kind of just like a recipe. They're ingredients. They don't describe something holistically. If you add all the pillars together from a design concept, they don't give you the thing that you're trying to build. Um, and then lastly, there's like core fantasy or fantasy fulfillment, um, which is my least favorite uh, because it tends to rely on you actually wanting to do the thing that you do in the game, um, which isn't all that common. Um, so after a lot of iteration, I finally come around uh, to the framework of creative promises as the highest level goals on a project. With the idea of a promise being a concrete commitment from, from you the, or the team to the audience about what's important about the game, um, about what they'll actually get out of, out of playing it. Um, and promises have all these kind of really special qualities to me that makes this framework valuable. Uh, a promise has potential. It isn't any good on its own. It doesn't do anything by itself. It's only good if it's fulfilled. Uh, it's fragile and it implies a lot of work on your part, on the promiser's part. Um, promises imply a part of the game that you have no control over, the, the audience. There's a receiver of a promise. Um, and that receiver immediately has expectations and obligations to, from you uh, based on hearing the promise. They have a thing that they've heard and now they want something. They feel personal and they feel moral. If you break a promise, it's on you, the person who did it. Um, and they feel concrete in a way these other things don't. Um, people can check against a promise. You can very quickly ask somebody if a promise is being kept or, may, or, or, or uh, broken. And they have a pretty honest answer in a way that if you describe all the pillars and ask if the pillars are supported well enough, um, it feels very squishy. Um, I found that good creative promises are very clear and concrete. They, con they promise something specific to people that they can imagine. Um, and they're very generative. They prompt ideas in the receiver of the promise. They make people want things. They make people desire things. And by creating this clear desire, um, you can then do the mental exercise about what fulfilling a promise would really look like. You can quickly generate ideas based on the expectations created by your promise. You can check if the game is really supporting it by actually looking at your features and looking at the promises and seeing if those things actually connect in a way. Um, and they encourage people to take ideas to their limit. Um, if you say that your game has a creative goal of, I don't know, reuniting with your estranged family, that means one thing. But if you say that's a promise, the game promises that experience, um, people tend to take ideas a lot further um, in ways that are in either interesting thoughts experiments or expose conflicts within that creative promise and other parts of the design. Um, a game's creative promises should articulate what you feel is most worthwhile about the game, what you hope someone would get out of it, what you hope it will offer them. Um, it should let people know if it's something that is worth their time to play. Um, on Bioshock 2, one of our core creative promises was that you got to play a big daddy, um, which was the, the kind of iconic enemy from the first game. Um, but this had a huge impact, not just on our feature set, but also on our, our narrative design. Um, we added the concept of little sister adoption. You now could adopt little sisters and, and walk around with them. Um, and we also added a, uh, a whole new area of systemic gameplay around defense. You know, big daddies are, are protectors, and um, you can place your little sister down and actually protect them. And we added all these sorts of new tools and verbs and player dynamics um, around defensive gameplay. Um, also, because the big Daddy was like the 
the most fearsome thing in the first game, we needed added uh, an apex predator above them, which is where the, little, the big sister came from. Um, and for all that gameplay, we tried to implement it in a way that was true to our other core design values of having it be you know, fully systemic and immersive and sort of playing by the same rules as the player. Um, also added a bunch of you know, lower level mechanics and things that people expected like a drill. Um, but lastly, it informed our narrative and our themes and focused them around kind of uh, you know, familiar relationships and community building and the legacy that you leave behind the world with your children and the decisions that uh, you make and how they impact them. Um, and this was back before every game was about being a dad, uh, which is like it is now. So we're kind of at the forefront of all that. Um, in the case of Psychonauts, these are some of the, the promises uh, that we're exploring um, are things like you are a psychic, you're raised in the circus, you travel inside people's minds and, and help them, um, you're a kid in an adult's world. Um, these promises might seem really straightforward um, and very clear, uh, and that's kind of the point and that's kind of what makes them so powerful as a creative framework. You can't hide behind them as, as vague and inspiring ideas, you have to stand next to them and help support them and help them come to life. Um, and so that's sort of what I placed at the top of that creative hierarchy. Uh, next up is design values. Design values are where uh, your basic design principles or standards that inform you, how you make everything on the project um, and what you value in the creation of it. Um, you know, you might value things like immersion or consequences or consistency or depth or novelty or whatever. You can probably list out dozens and dozens and dozens of values that you might embrace in the construction of a, of a project. Um, the thing that's nice about values as a framework um, is that most of the time it's understood that all values are, are good. Every single one of those is fantastic, like clarity, cool, accessibility, let's have it. Um, but there's also a, a pretty clear understanding that uh, values are in conflict with one another. It's almost impossible to do both of these things, all of these things at the same time. Clarity might lead you to make um, consequences of player's decision very clear and super obvious in your UI and say, you know, Clementine will remember that or whatever. Um, but that might be against your idea of, of immersion and what that means for you in the game. Um, all values are good, but they're not necessarily the right values for your game. And your choice of those values, how you define them, how you prioritize them, has a huge impact on how you make decisions on the game. Um, your teammates and collaborators also bring specific creative values with them. And it's really good to get explicit about that and explicit about what we value and what it means um, and how they contribute to the game because you'll be using that implicitly throughout the rest of your production otherwise. Um, by explicitly ranking design values, you expose these weak de definitions and conflicts on the team. You don't need to eliminate values that are in conflict because they're naturally in conflict. You just need to have a guide for, uh, for decision making. Um, in the case of Psychonauts 2, a couple examples here, we have this concept of uh, playable surrealism that's ranked pretty high. Um, surrealism, like immersion, is obviously a really slippery concept that you could spend 100 years studying. Um, but it also could potentially just mean gratuitously weird, add weird stuff to the game. Um, plus, also ranked above uh, the surrealism value is a value of consistency, that we do want the game to, to be a consistent experience for the player, where people can sort of you know, use their understanding of the simulation to, to play the game. Um, so over time, we've come to define it as novel but consistent breakage of physical rules. Um, and that covers a pretty broad swath of things, um, and bizarre imagery drawing from subconscious or metaphorical meaning. These are pretty narrow definitions of something as big as surrealism, um, but it makes it operable and actionable for, for the team in terms of, of what we're building. And it's also always something that somebody can challenge later. Um, this isn't meant to be written in stone. Um, we have another value of narrative grounding uh, that's actually ranked above almost everything but, but game feel. You know, Psychonauts is a game about entering people's minds and learning about them from the inside out, and it's really important that we sort of filter every mechanic, every little piece of story, every enemy you fight, all that stuff through that character's story and their, um, their sense of the world. Um, and so it is something that you know, gets ranked all the way above almost everything else except for, for game feel, um, the moment to moment kind of playability of the game. That's the thing we won't compromise in terms of design values versus narrative grounding. Um, and it might sound like those things wouldn't come into conflict naturally, but they, they absolutely do. <laughs> um, so recently, uh, in addition to design values, I also added the concept of cultural values, partially based on the work of Mary Flanagan and Helen Nislam, as summarized in this book, Values at Play in Digital Games, which is great. Um, cultural values are a way for the team to express what they value outside of the game experience um, that they'd like the game to communicate, either by representing these values implicitly in the game's design or more directly in the narrative or the content. They're explicitly an agenda for your team, and that's really a good thing, because otherwise you have an implicit agenda. Um, they're a way to make sure that the game is expressing things that you actually believe in or want to push out into the world. Um, you might value you things like representation or equal justice or empathy or nonviolent conflict resolution um, or even just using the player's time respectfully could be a thing that you value contributing to the culture. Um, and while 
design values are pretty self-contained. Cultural values reference the game's impact on the outside world and, and what you're saying about it. They need to be there to help you align your own personal values with what the game is actually saying. They help you get explicit about what cultural messages you want to convey and what lines you might not want to cross. Um, and if you don't do this as a conscious effort, then guess what? Your game just does it anyway. Um, and while design values might be in conflict with each other, um, cultural values might be in conflict with you. Um, the game might be expressing things that you really strongly disagree with, uh, or the messages expressed in kind of narrative or thematic layers can be in massive conflict with the rest of the game design if you're not explicit about these things. Um, so some of the values, uh, cultural values that we're using in Psychonauts Studio, this is not an exhaustive list, I just sort of brought three that were easy enough to explain. Um, is first up, diverse representation. We value diversity in our game cast, and we want to make a game that people of all backgrounds can sort of see themselves reflected in, and that's a cultural value that we have. Um, no mental health stigma. Um, Psychonauts deals a lot with mental health um, and diving inside of people's minds and understanding them from the inside out. Um, and as a fairly cartoonish game, we're not going to do that in a medically accurate way. And so it's important for us to have a, a value of doing that in a very empathetic way um, that humanizes everyone, that doesn't ever stigmatize or stereotype anyone, um, and sort of treats people with full humanity. And so that's something that's you know, a guiding light as we create all of the kind of mental worlds for Psychonauts too. Um, and lastly, uh, the idea of just positive contribution um, is actually kind of dopey. It's just the idea that we want to have our characters and organizations in the game um, striving to do good in the world, and we believe that that good is possible, that it's possible to improve things positively for yourself and for others over time by trying. Um, and that might seem like a really kind of just dopey, obvious, optimistic thing, but if it's not something that you explicitly talk about as being central to the, the, the sort of message of, of the game that you're making, um, it's really easy for stuff to slip in that undermines that message. And so um, that kind of optimism Optimism. We do want to be making an optimistic game that shows that you can actually improve yourself and improve the world through, through trying. Um, just like any other category, the stuff that you put into um, your cultural values can be debated, prioritized, defined, broken down, um, or cut if you feel like you really can't deliver on it. Um, but without a specific framework that's shared, these debates devolve into self-referential design conversations that skirt around people's real concerns. Um, in the case of the Bureau, XCOM Declassified, uh, a game I worked on, um, you know, we uh, had a lot of discussion on the team. People wanted to have um, women XCOM agents in the game. Um, and the reason why not to was supposedly uh, historical accuracy, like it still is for people. Um, and, you know, it's funny to laugh at that, but we just had no framework to talk about the value of equal representation versus historical accuracy or define what historical accuracy was for an alternate universe sci-fi game um, <laughs> or what that might even mean. Um, and so the conversations just aren't productive because we're not speaking a shared language and it hasn't been made explicit. Um, and so you need to get those ideas at, on the table as a positive value to be discussed, prioritized, and uh, have resources dedicated to, um, or not, and have that be an explicit choice that people are making. Um, if you find yourself losing cultural value debates, you need to make them very explicit with, with yourself and the team. Uh, on to the feature stuff. So interaction paradigms. Um, I found it's important to have a high-level category that focuses on what the player does outside of any particular feature implementation. Um, you know, what uh, what is the player actually? How do they interact with the world? And what sort of verbs or action does the player does the game give them? Um, interaction paradigms kind of ser serve as a super feature that describe all your modes of interaction with the world. Um, I have a pretty big tent notion of what interactivity means. It might include like looking or reading or walking places. You can make a whole game out of just about any kind of interaction. I don't care. Um, but it also might include more mechanical stuff like turn-based strategic combat or base building or whatever. Um, it doesn't need to fit within genre boundaries, but often that can be a nice shorthand. Um, and it doesn't dictate what format these things take, but it does help articulate from an early point what the player um, does in your game. Again, if anybody wants to make a game that has these six things in it all at once, uh, except for maybe the cutscenes, that's not a not a good one. Um, so defining and prioritizing these core paradigms can help you articulate creative promises that don't translate into actionable interactions for your game. Um, and if that's the case, you need to go to prototyping. You need to be building something to prove how that creative promise is going to translate into the interactive experience. It can also help prompt a lot of questions as to why you have these interactions in your game. Often they are just genre boilerplate. Um, and it's worth really scrutinizing them to see if you really need uh, you know, a crafting system or a skill tree or a combat in your game. Like are these things that are actually create, uh, contributing to the core creative promises at the heart of your game. Um, you can also start to see interaction types that aren't you're not prepared to deliver on because they just don't have features supporting them. Um, in the case of Bioshock 2, uh, we had inherited a crafting system from the first game, and after we got our board all lined up, it was pretty obvious that like it was very low ranked for us, didn't really contribute to any of our high-level creative goals, we didn't really have like, features we were excited about for doing it, and so we, um, we cut it, and I think no one noticed, actually, that we cut it from the second game. Um, 
So now onto the actual features. I'll try to go through this pretty quickly. Uh, you will have a lot of feature cards um, because the idea is to just get everything everyone discussed down on a card. Um, and this, when I say features, it can be anything. It's gameplay mechanics, rendering features, a location you think is cool, a character, whatever, however you want to discuss it. Um, I don't stack rank these. I put them into sort of three subcategories that are, are ranked um, and three very special categories that I'll go through finally. Um, first, the required features are things you feel like you absolutely need. They strongly support your creative promises and you can't imagine making a good version of your game without them. This list should be relatively small and focused as much as possible and something that the team really strongly feels is doable within the scope and the time and the resources that you have, um, leaving room for even more stuff later. It should be a stripped down version of your game. Ideally, you will have done everything off of your required features by the time that you actually ship. Um, the next one is desired features, which is kind of the middle of the bell curve. Uh, these are all cool ideas that you're really excited about, but they have a slightly limited impact, or you can imagine shipping the game without them, or they're alternate competing ideas and you're not sure which one you're going to do. There's usually a ton of stuff um, in this big, giant middle of the cookie sandwich, uh, and you'll probably ship a, a very small fraction of it before you, uh, or before you finish the game. Um, often these are ideas that are just waiting uh, for the right moment and the right sort of creative challenge to get populated really into the game, um, but often a lot of them do get, do get cut, and that's totally cool. Uh, wishlist features are things that seem good, they're probably not necessary, they're probably out of scope. If somebody dumped, brought a dump truck full of money up to your house, maybe you'd do a lot of them. Um, this list is usually pretty small. Because people can kind of tell if it can at least make it up to desired features, it's probably going to just get dumped. Um, and realistically, like 90% of everything off the wish list does get dumped uh, around mid-production. Um, but sometimes it is just waiting again for the right time to pop up. Uh, but it is also super important to have a place where uh, ideas go when people are not willing to quite let go of them. That you love this idea and there's something cool about it and you still want to keep talking about it, but it's not in the plan yet. Um, and you're not quite really willing to let go of it. Uh, so you can put it down in the wish list and it kind of serves as like an idea hospice where people can visit the ideas that aren't long for this world. Um, <laughs> Uh, but they're still there. They're still around. Um, uh, the boilerplate is, is pretty easy. Video games are full of uh, annoying features that we have to do to ship that we're not really excited about, like UI or save load or localization or your platform TRCs or whatever. Um, it's not worth having much of a discussion about these things. Uh, I usually just sort of corral them into one tiny corner of the board um, and stick them there. And it's really nice to have them on the board, uh, both to keep kind of visibly in your scope over time, to know and remind yourself that you have to do them. Um, and also you can do the mental exercise of like, what if we had no save load in our game? Does the rest of it hang together? Um, you can do those mental exercises with them represented up there. Um, next up is the cornfield. The cornfield uh, is a special category where ideas go to die. Um, while you're working through the board, either because of priority or scope or whatever, um, you'll, your team will come to the conclusion that you're really not doing an idea. And this covers creative promises, this covers values, this covers anything that you've talked about doing or including at some point um, that you've all decided not to do. And you can even write down on the card of why you decided not to do it and then pin it down in the cornfield uh, and banish it. It's super valuable as a ritual to have somebody physically move their card that they've been defending down into uh, the cornfield and sort of say goodbye to it. Um, uh, for now, it just sits there down in the cornfield, which is why it's cornfield and not a graveyard. Um, and you can revisit it. You can kind of go back there and look at all the little misfit toys and see if they want to be back in the game or what. Or you can wait until the end of the game and look at all the stupid stuff that you're really glad that you didn't do. Um, but again, it keeps it sort of physically present on the board for everybody to look at. Um, so the last category is a, a recent addition um, that I added for Psychonauts 2. Uh, because the big board such a, puts such a premium on having concrete and actionable ideas, um, but sometimes there's something embedded in one of your creative promises that just makes the same idea just keep coming up again and again and again, and people want it, and you have no idea how to do it at all. If you did know how to do it, you would do it, but you don't know how to do it. Um, and so it can't really live as a feature, because those are things that you sort of have a plan for. Um, and so I've ended this idea of, of foggy notions. Um, Psychonauts 2, for example, every time we talk about one of our creative promises that you're a psychic, immediately people are like, cool, I want fortune telling. I want to be able to tell the future. It's like, we don't know how to do that right now. Um, if we come up with a way to do it, we should totally put it in the game. Um, and so foggy notions can kind of serve as a bounty board for your team. There's a bunch of good ideas that you just don't know how to do, and if somebody wants to run off and prototype it, or have a design meeting about it, or bring it as a problem to solve, um, it totally would end up being in the game. And it's nice to have a place for those things to sort of physically live. Uh, so that's it. That's all the categories on, on the board. Um, and for all of these, I go through sort of the process that I defined before, which is you have a generation of ideas, you do brainstorming, you discuss the terms, you do prioritization and scoping. Um, and you end up with something either big or small, um, depending on the size of your overall project. This is sort of a, obviously a structural view of it, or it might look something like this. This is the Bioshock 2 uh, big board um, in some point in mid-production. Uh, you can see, I think this is, I think this is where we cut all the underwater stuff. Those are the holes. Um, uh, but the thing that you really have is, you know, um, 
The thing that you've built together is a team that built a whole project uh, in their head, and they understand how things connect hierarchically, and they understand why they're there, and the values they support, and they understand the values that you're trying to express through the game. Um, and the people who go through that process together uh, have this idea of the, head, of the game mapped out in their head in a way I've found completely, uh, it's impossible to replicate through other ways. And it kind of serves as a superpower for doing additional creative work on the project. So I'm gonna go through um, some of those uses right now. Um, you can kind of use it as a, a compass that tells you where you all agreed to go together and use it to glide and clarify direction as a razor to help decide um, whether a feature should be included or minimized or cut. Or as a contract, you can revisit it and say, these are the things we all agreed to do together. How are we doing on it? And hold yourself accountable. Um, so these are some of the, the concrete practices I've used uh, the big board for in, in the past. Um, going through one by one, uh, hypothetical design. This is actually really fun and one of the most enjoyable things that once you build a big board, um, now that you've agreed on the priorities of everything on the board and you've had these big, long, laborious conversations about it, um, you can just scramble it and see what how it remaps. Um, and you don't have to do it in a way that makes sense. What if your last rank thing was your number rank one rank thing? Because um, once you have it all mapped out in your head, you understand how all the pieces connect, it's actually pretty easy to sort of very quickly go through a version of the game that represents a different set of priorities. Um, you know, we did that on Bioshock 2. We're like, all right, well, before we cut all this underwater stuff, what if the game was just about underwater? It's like, okay, well, we probably wouldn't have any on-land gameplay. I mean, we build the whole game. We just, you know, you can do that mental exercise. Um, and this is valuable as a challenge for the team and walking through the design, but it also can be really useful if somebody has sort of an alternate version of the game that they really are excited about and you can work it through and sort of take it through to the end um, and maybe it is a better version of the game than the one that you should be making and if not you can kind of name it and freeze it out and put it aside and they work that through their system. Um, Next up, you can use the board for checking promise fulfillment. Um, this is a big one. You need to look at your promises and see that you're actually uh, fulfilling them. You know, is it fulfilling the creative promises? Are they uh, reflected in the feature set? And more importantly, um, are they showing up on screen? Um, it's important to note that this uh, is a lot, I'm talking about a lot of discussion, and a lot of um, sort of conceptual work. All of this should be complemented by actually really building your game at the same time. Um, and so, but early on, you can just do it by walking people through the board and asking people if they buy it. You know, do you feel like this game is on track to deliver on the things at the high level. Um, and that's part of why I use creative promises, because they allow people to give that answer in a way that other kind of high-level creative goals don't really seem to allow people to speak in that way. Um, and you can ask it to everyone. You can bring people in, and uh, you should really take no answers seriously and chase them down, because breaking your promises is a huge deal, um, at least it is to me. Uh, it could be because of a bunch of different reasons. Um, you aren't serious about it. Uh, it's not actually a promise you're committed to um, or haven't been able to execute on it, and your feature set doesn't reflect that promise or it's not showing up on the screen. This is often because you don't actually have to have, uh, know, have the resources to deliver on it, um, or you don't know how to deliver on it. You don't actually know how to break it down into something that actually works, uh, and you need to be doing more prototyping. Um, sometimes what you find is you actually have the wrong promise, that you've actually built something um, that is good, but it's good in a totally different way than the thing that you plan, in which case you need to revise what your plan is. Um, but when people feel like the game isn't delivering on its promises, it's important to accept the challenge and to try to figure out how to do better uh, or change your plan. Um, next up is creative conflicts. Uh, this is where I see the biggest problems in most projects, and you can use the big board um, to check for active conflicts between promises and values and features. Um, often project, projects have hidden conflicts in them uh, that don't get exposed without some scrutiny, and in fact, most projects I've been on where after the fact it didn't go well, it got canceled, the end result was not good, uh, is because in retrospect there was some unresolved conflict within the core creative design of the game or within the team. Um, I'm gonna go over four of these real quick. Uh, conflict number one, creative differences. Um, it's really common, common to have a few high-level cards that your major stakeholders rank differently. Um, sometimes it's just a natural process and you work it through and it resolves over time, um, but sometimes it's indicative of a really deep conflict about people wanting different things for the game uh, or in the, a conflict in its very premise. Um, I'm always really wary to keep two cards at the exact same level for any length of time because if people aren't willing to at least just put one below the other one, um, there's a conflict that's going to come out and it's going to come out on screen eventually. Um, and it can sink projects. Uh, in the case of, again, uh, XCOM, the Bureau XCOM Classified, at no point did we have a solid consensus across the team um, as to our priority between kind of like the tactical high stakes gameplay that we had inherited for XCOM and the action shooter that we had, uh, had been tasked with creating. Um, we could never decide which one of these things was more important, and people all over the team had many different ideas about what was important to them. Um, and that lack of clear understanding is absolutely reflected in the, the game that eventually shipped. Um, 
Conflict number two uh, is the idea called Holy Grails. Um, Holy Grails is where you're trying to get all the things you like about something and none of the things that you don't like about it. And so these usually express themselves as like really lofty, good sounding ideas, like an incredibly accessible dwarf fortress, or Resident Evil 4 with really good controls, or Dota with no toxic community. Um, and usually there's a reason why these things take the form they do. And either you know the weaknesses allow for the strengths, or the strengths sort of imply the weaknesses over time and result in them. And you need to be really wary about focusing on what you aren't doing uh, and be extremely explicit about what positive parts that you're actually pursuing, because you're probably not going to do everything those games do. Um, in the case of, of Spelunky, um, that was kind of an attempt uh, to make what used to be uh, a, a holy grail game an accessible roguelike. Um, it seems like a solved problem now, but at the time it absolutely wasn't. Um, Derek Yu details in his book about the way that he sort of tackled this problem was by breaking rogue roguelikes down into really, really, really specific parts and choosing which parts he uh, actively wanted to pursue, um, which out of all everything you could do for roguelikes, it was randomized levels, having permadeath, and having consistent rules. Um, you don't need to walk away from trying to do a holy grail, but you need to be extremely explicit about what positive goals you're pursuing instead of just like trying to refine out the negatives somehow. Um, these are often solved by prototyping rather than just sort of clarifying priorities and discussion, um, because just promising a holy grail doesn't do anything to solve it. If the solutions were obvious, um, then those games would already have those positive traits um, and everybody would already be doing them. Um, next conflict, chocolate and peanut butter. Uh, there's something really alluring about mashing up two ideas that obviously don't work together and don't feel like they fit. Um, what if their combination creates something magical that no one has ever seen before? Um, these are usually big ideas in direct opposition and often genre map up mashups, like the highly replayable linear narrative or you know the XCOM problem that I talked about. In the case of uh, the Downfall Project at Crystal Dynamics, um, we had a lot of light-based gameplay, like Alan Wake, you would fight monsters with flashlights. We also had a real-time time of day cycle, and so the shadows would all move in real time. It's just completely idiotic to put both of those things in the same game. Don't do that. Um, yeah, groans from the audience. That's great. It's a long time ago. Um, <laughs> there's a huge project risk there. So proposing the successful combination of things that seem incompatible is super exciting, and it's actually really motivating to people to have that challenge. Um, but sometimes those things are literally incompatible, and there's no way to do both of them, and one of them has to move. Um, and if you can't prototype your way out of it in a realistic amount of time, uh, you have to let it go and, and move on. Um, it's an experiment, not, not a project plan. Um, conflict four, mixed messages. This is where one idea literally undermines the other, creating uh, creative dissonance or subtextual hypocrisy. Um, usually this happens at the level of your features or lack of features undermining a creative promise or a cultural value. Um, for example, you might have a game that simultaneously tries to true, show the true horrors of war, um, but literally only thing you can do in that game is, is killing things. Uh, or you might have a game that tries to critique toxic masculinity, but also has super sweet, brutal melee executions that you can upgrade to get more experience with. Um, and maybe those two things should not be in the same game, possibly. Um, and a lot of this comes from not taking your creative promises or your cultural values like really seriously or getting trapped in conflicts between cultural values and design values. Um, you might not be able to resolve these kind of things on your project. You might be working for a very large corporation that needs your game to sell 800 mil 8 million units and hit a certain kind of gameplay. Um, but you should be making those choices consciously and not backing into them, uh, or worse, sort of indicting players for a conflict that is your conflict and not, not their conflict. Um, if you really want to make a game that expresses something, um, you have to filter out the gameplay systems through that, and that might mean not doing some things every once in a while. Um, the big point here is, uh, as much as possible, you should intend the things that your game is actually saying. Um, games are speech, and all speech represents these kinds of values and politics. And as a creative community, we need to get past the idea that it's possible to have a game that has no message at all. Um, and I honestly can't believe we just had this discussion again at the last E3, that it's possible to just have a game that just doesn't mean anything. It just asks questions. Um, so take control of, of what your game is saying to people, um, both in its text and in its subtext, uh, and be aware of it and, and own it um, as part of your project plan. Um, overall, though, these kinds of conflicts are pretty much the hardest issues surfaced by the big board, and it's important to take them seriously and come up with a plan to make them work in conflict, uh, stack rank their importance, um, or remove the conflicts from your plan, um, and be aware of how conflicts affect what your game means to people, um, because at the end of the day, uh, the conflicts will become what your game means to people, um, and you won't be in control of that. Um, so the big board is a tool. Uh, it's not a panacea. It won't solve every problem. Um, in fact, it'll cause some occasionally. Uh, so I'll go through some of those real quick. Um, uh, so there's some disadvantages. First up, that it's really designy um, and, and kind of nerdy, and uh, both in terms of being a super analytical um, and also involving an exhaustive amount of discussion and rediscussion and you know articulation about stuff. Um, and if you're dealing with a team that doesn't like that kind of extended discussion, if it's not you know where, where, what they enjoy about making games, or they communicate in completely other ways, uh, it can turn into one-way communication and not actually be a, a useful tool. So I think it does require a certain kind of team that's willing to engage with ideas um, in that way. 
Um, some of that might be mitigated by finding categories that your team's really excited about, um, or by complementing it with other kinds of direction and exploration, and using other tools. Again, especially be building your games, doing prototype, doing R&D. This is one thing that you should be doing. Um, Risk two, time and investment. It requires you to have kind of your creative stakeholders there from an early point and to spend a ton of time with them. Um, as people roll onto the team, the investment in this process gets less. And so there's one cohort that sort of builds the original big board, another cohort that helps iterate on it, and then a you know, third cohort that eventually just sort of gets trotted into a room and you're like, here's the board, let's walk you through it. Um, eventually, this can become, again, monolithic one-way communication. Um, I'm not convinced that's avoidable depending on team size. And every time I've run this process, there's a time in production where it just does become that. It becomes a thing that's sitting in a room that you point to every once in a while. Um, risk number three is that you can overpack the schedule. Uh, there's a premium on making, uh, coming up with a lot of ideas and packing all of those ideas all into one place and looking at all this cool sort of source material you have to deal with. Um, but that can be overwhelming to people and it can make it feel like there's a lot less creative white space to fill in on the project and a lot uh, fewer areas for people to contribute as they go. Um, and that's bad because you want creative contributions from everyone on your team. And also the ideas you have later will be way better than the ideas that you have early on. Um, and so you really do have to um, keep your sort of required feature list very, very light and really push people and challenge people to continue to challenge what's already up on the board and come up with new ideas and keep on sort of that process moving. Otherwise, um, people will get crowded out by the 8 million cards that are sitting there. Um, lastly, also, it's not objective. This is not like a magical process to make good games. It's a process by talking about, it's a talk process about talking about the game you're making with the people you're making it. Um, it can sort of feel objective. You can get lost in the weeds when you're sort of discussing specific terms and the priorities and all the rest of that. And it's possible to get lost in the weeds. Um, the important part of this process is learning about uh, your own values and other people's values and priorities and creative affinities for the project. And you keep the team focused on uh, the outcomes and moving forward and not get bogged down in the big board as an end in itself. Um, ultimately, it's a tool to help you decide what to build and you shouldn't lose sight of that. Um, but for me, some of these risks have, have been worth it, especially early on on the project, um, in terms of getting unity across the team and uh, giving a way for people to contribute creatively within the scope of a project. Um, before I tie it up, just some last bits of advice if anybody wants to try to use this process for projects of their own. Um, keep it physical and present, like keep it on an actual board. I've tried doing it on Trello before and it just sort of dies a very quick death. Um, there's something very magical about having this thing as an artifact that people can touch and move cards around. Um, welcome ideas from everywhere. It's just a board. You can put more cards on it. You should. Everybody who has an opinion should be able to contribute. Um, and don't back away from hard conversations. If people look at your whole construction and they're like, I don't buy it. I don't think you're actually fulfilling these things. I would, yeah. Um, have that discussion. Even if it's a discussion you've already had before, because the buy-in from the team will be worth it. Um, revisit it regularly. Clean out your old assumptions that have changed. Add new ideas. Check your progress against creative promises. Um, and try to keep your promises. Uh, every team is different. Um, adapt the categories in a way that makes sense for you and your collaborators. Uh, use other tools in this. I'm just going to reiterate that again and again and again. Um, you should always be building something. This is not instead of building something. This is alongside building something. Um, and lastly, don't ever use Post-its. Post-its are terrible. They fall off the board. They go behind your desk. You lose a bunch of really cool ideas. And then you find them six months later, and you're very yeah. sad. Um, uh, Anyway, you know, just as a, as a final word, uh, I hope some of you find this tool useful, not just for smoothing out team communication, but for helping you design and create more intentionally, both as an individual and as a collaborator with other people. Um, life is too short to make work that doesn't feel personally meaningful. We should all be putting things into our games that are things that we value, and we should know why we value them. Games are an expressive medium, and you know, everyone working within games has a voice. Intentionally working on your style and understanding your voice over time is hugely important for the creative health uh, of this art form, because we really need more idiosyncratic personal voices, not just creating small personal games, um, but big, weird commercial games, too. Um, and I hope this is a tool that helps some people with that work. And that's it for me. Yeah. Are we over? <laughs> oh, there. So there's time for some questions. questions. OK, yeah. So let's just go uh, straight to the audience for uh, right. Q&A so we can uh, have Who time. else would we go to? Uh, I will repeat the questions uh, just right. so that, uh, is this on? Are we getting me? OK. Yeah. Right. Right. So, how the, does this work? Sorry, how, how does this work emotionally with your team members? Because you might be making people cry. Yeah. 
The yeah. question is, how do you make changes to the board without making people cry? Uh, <laughs> as well as you can. Um, yeah, I mean, there are things where, I mean, hopefully the initial process of setting it up is very collaborative, and that sort of first round version of it is something that you can involve everybody in. Um, but then at different points down the road, there will be places where you make changes or cuts or changes in priority, and not everybody ends up being involved. Um, and my attitude for that with the big board or anything else is to just try to do that in as humane a way as possible of like, you know, pull people into the fold, talk them through it, you know, see if they disagree. If they do disagree, like really take that seriously and walk it through. And so it just sort of takes time. Um, you know, as pressure goes up on a bigger project, there, there do come points where you're just like, hey, we did this thing, I'm sorry about it, and that's how it is, um, and still try to treat that as humanely as possible. The other thing that you can do also um, is the big board organization does lend itself to subcomponents. Um, you can have a big board for a sub part of your game um, that doesn't cover everything. You know, like on the Bioshock 2 board I did, I was not the creative lead on that project. I was the lead designer, um, so it was very design focused, but it wasn't totally narrative focused, um, and the creative director participated in that process, but I was, I was owning it. And I've also worked with other people who have done like, hey, I'm just the combat designer, and I'm gonna do it just for for combat or whatever. Um, so you can also give people ownership over like smaller boards that represent a subsection of the process and have you know, a board of boards, which is really <laughs> crazy. Yeah. Um, just wondering if, if uh, during the development process, do you ever like check off an idea that's like, hey, the film has promised that we have this feature? Like, uh, the question is, during the development process, do you ever say we have delivered on this goal and so it's checked off so we don't have to worry about it's it anymore. Not a task tracker. Yeah, it's not a, it's not a task tracker. I mean, we will essentially be like, okay, these features got done. In terms of the high level like creative promises and values, like those never go away. You always need to do better on those and it's always re revisiting them and being like, are we really doing enough? And I don't think there's been any case where I'm like, yeah, nailed it. We're done. Um, uh, and also, like as things get completed, you don't pull them off the board because the thing is still supposed to holistically represent the, the design of the game. Um, you can use the board to dump it into task tracking and then just take everything from your feature list and like dump it in whatever task tracking software you use and use it to generate a schedule. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't represent a schedule itself. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it so, can work. work. The question oh, is, uh, what if you're already in the process, do you think it, it's still valuable to do this if you didn't do this at the beginning of the, of the making the game, you're in the middle of the game, would you start this uh, as, a, as a project in the middle of the game? Yeah, yeah I mean, I'm, I've absolutely done that numerous times. Um, I, that could be really helpful for articulating any sort of creative conflicts that have come up on the project or sort of missing holes in the design um, or just doing triage on something if it's not kind of working out well on screen. So it is totally possible. The buy-in is not quite the same. You don't quite get like the level of investment in having built it all up, um, but it does definitely drive a lot of good conversations, especially if a project is kind of at a crisis point where people are throwing up their hands and I, you know, I don't really understand what this thing's supposed to be or I don't understand what criteria we're using to make decisions about what we do or don't do. Um, it's a way to sort to pull all that out of people and get it explicit. Um, so it can totally be a worthwhile thing to do um, you know, well into to production. Uh, one more question. Um, let me go back there. Yeah, I'm just struck by how, how brief the, the parts seem. Mm. The question is, the cards seem like they don't have a lot on them. Where yeah. do all the details about what those cards mean go? Uh, I mean, it kind of depends on your team. If you're doing this with a real small, dedicated uh, group of people, um, they're worked out in the room um, and based on understanding. Um, or they're worked out as that thing actually becomes a thing that's represented really in your game. And you can point to something in your game that's, that's doing that. They're not meant to replace documentation. If you need more extensive documentation to explain ideas, you can use kind of other tools for that. But it is important for the process, at least as it has been for me, to keep these things relatively straightforward. Um, and very modular and to break them down to the point where people feel okay representing them with just a couple of words on, on the board. Um, and so you can have details where things get bundled under a single card or they reference something where it's like, here's the blah system and there's a 20 page doc on the wiki that you wanna read about it. Um, and you can complement it by that. But um, I think it's important to have the board itself represent some you know, high level brevity so people can kind of absorb it all at once. All right, thank you, Zach. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.